So thank you all for being here to our March IHE third Thursday Lunch and Learn. And uh, today we're honored to have Dr. Ari Cohn be our presenter. He is the professor of political science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he is also the Schlesinger Professor of Social Justice and the director of the Norman and Beatrice Harris Center for Judaic Studies. Cohn has published multiple books, including In Defense of Human Rights, A Non-Religious Grounding in Pluralistic World, and serves as co-editor of a book series with the University of Nebraska Press, Contemporary Holocaust Studies, which examines Holocaust studies through contemporary research and its impact on teaching Holocaust education. The most recent volume of the series, Antisemitism on the Rise, the 1930s and Today, was released in 2021. IHE is very honored to have been a part of both of these uh, uh, editions that have, have come out, and we look forward to our continued relationship. Ari is also a member of our Governance Council, and we're very pleased to have him here today. So I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. And if you need to share screen, I'll make you co-host just in case. I don't. Okay. I don't. This is a very lo-fi presentation, uh, but thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you that I can see. If anybody else would like to be seen, I always love seeing people. Um, if not, it's lovely to see your names. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to chat with you today. If at any point uh, the volume of my voice uh, changes or you would like me to talk louder or um, I somehow uh, mysteriously stop being heard, please let me know. My AirPods are old and slightly dysfunctional. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, lovely, uh, really, to be with you. I am excited to talk with you a little bit about uh, some of the research that we're doing down in Lincoln uh, on Holocaust education, on anti-Semitism. Um, there's a lot going on um, through the Harris Center. Faculty um, uh, of the Harris Center are, are, are very engaged in these topics. And, um, and so uh, it's great to, to have an opportunity to chat with you about some of the things that we're doing uh, in Lincoln. Um, the, the first thing I'll, I'll just talk very briefly about is, as Scott mentioned, we, uh, we have this ongoing um, symposium series uh, that leads to, um, to edited volumes every couple of years. And um, unfortunately, we've had to take a hiatus from this due to COVID, but we're hoping to, um, to get these things ramped back up again in the very near future, uh, and even hopefully to expand them uh, and bring some of this uh, to Omaha as well. Um, so uh, we, uh, my colleague, Gerald Steinacher and I in the history department uh, hit on this idea of doing um, a, a symposium every other year on some aspect of Holocaust education. Um, and we uh, first started doing this um, uh, when Liz Feldstern, uh, in fact, was the IHE director. Uh, and she was very, very helpful um, in, in um, working with us to get this off the ground. She participated in our first uh, symposium, uh, which led to a book on the phenomenon of Holocaust rescue and how best to teach Holocaust rescue. Um, and, uh, and then, as Scott mentioned, uh, we had our um, our last of these symposia in 2019 on anti-Semitism uh, and kind of the rising tide of anti-Semitism um, in the U.S. and around the world. And, uh, and Scott um, was, uh, was a presenter there and did a terrific job. Uh, and then um, uh, the IHE staff uh, has been uh, absolutely crucial to the success of these books because we're not simply putting together research papers. We're also talking about how to take research on the Holocaust and make sure that it's accessible for educators to use. And the IHG staff has helped us um, uh, by creating discussion questions for educators for every chapter of the volume. Uh, and I think it's made um, a real difference in what we have put out because it's, um, it's very unlike other academic books on this topic in that it's directly taking new research and pairing it with, um, with teaching application. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I would encourage you if you're, if you're looking for something uh, to read, you can of course pick up our latest volume, uh, 
Mark can probably even tell us if we have it um, uh, on hand in the library or if they have to um, unbox it from somewhere. But, um, but certainly uh, I know that copies are floating around the Omaha Jewish community and you can read Scott's contribution, which is excellent. Um, and um, you know, we've, uh, one thing that we've, we've really seen um, is that uh, because these books are combining research and teaching, uh, people have a, a much broader group have been interested in them. It's not simply um, a book that academics write for other academics, um, but we're trying as much as we can to make these accessible uh, with, with varied success. You know, some of the chapters are certainly more accessible than others to a general public and to educators. Um, at the at the high school level, for example, but but something that we're really focused on doing is trying to make this accessible um, to as many people as we can, because we believe the topic is absolutely, you know, each time the topic is really crucial uh, and timely. And in this case, unfortunately, timely. Um, what we are hoping to do uh, with this series in the future um, is again, working with Scott, uh, Kale, others at the IAG, uh, we're hoping to do um, a workshop specifically for educators that uh, hopefully we can do in the not too distant future um, uh, at the JCC in Omaha. And we are hoping that we can, you know, kind of talk a lot about how we can um, take some of the research that's being done, especially um, in Lincoln, and make it accessible so that teachers can see kind of um, some of the best practices sorts of ideas that we're coming up with um, and, and talk through together ways to integrate that into their classrooms uh, in Nebraska and Iowa and, and anywhere else people come uh, to Omaha from to participate. Uh, we keep putting off when we're going to be able to do it, but hopefully uh, we can do it before long. Uh, and then we're, um, we're starting to gear up for um, what we hope will be our next symposium, which I think will be in the spring of next year. Uh, and um, our topic, at least at the moment, is, is going to be about kind of um, fascism uh, and the idea of um, you know, fascism of the 20s, 30s. Um, and then, of course, um, this kind of uh, illiberal neo-fascist um, moment that unfortunately we're experiencing now. Uh, in, in a variety of places around the world. Um, and so uh, that'll be uh, one of the kind of standard symposia that we do where we'll bring experts uh, from all over the world uh, down to Lincoln for a couple of days uh, where we'll talk together and these will be open to the community and, and I hope once we figure out when it will be, uh, you will you'll decide to join us. Uh, and then, um, and again, our hope is to put out another volume uh, like this one on that topic. Um, so that's, uh, kind of one of the, the big projects that we have going on uh, in Lincoln uh, at this time. Uh, the other, which I'll spend some additional time talking about, and then um, if you have questions or we can have a conversation. Um, uh, well, I guess before I get into that, I also want to mention, because Beth is here, I know you've all heard about Beth's project, but this is certainly an exciting Holocaust education project that's going on in Lincoln. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't heard about it, uh, you should, uh, because Beth Dotan, uh, who is a PhD student uh, in Lincoln, is doing uh, just an incredible, incredible project uh, that is creating from scratch um, a, a, a Holocaust education portal uh, that is specifically designed around so, uh, stories um, that are from Nebraska, right? So Nebraska survivors, uh, liberators um, here uh, with direct connections to our community. And um, when it launches, next month. Um, it will be um, a <laughs> deep, deep breath Beth, when it launches next month. Um, it will be uh, a, just a, a, an incredible teaching tool. Um, you know, not only will it be kind of a, something that's accessible to the public, um, but it, I think it will be specifically uh, really, really useful in classrooms, um, because, especially in Nebraska, because the students will be able to relate directly to the people's stories that they can access there. You know, those stories are going to mention places that they know, um, and, and, um, and, and that's going to be really, really meaningful for, for Holocaust education. Personalizing it is so important. Uh, and so we're, we're really lucky to have that project uh, that Beth is, is, um, is running uh, and that's going through the Center for uh, Research in the Digital Humanities. I'm probably messed up that acronym, CDRH, Center for Digital Research in the Humanities. Uh, I don't know. Um, so uh, if, you, if you haven't heard enough about that project, um, you should talk to Beth about it. Um, and in the meantime, you, know, you should wait and get excited for the launch 
it's going to be terrific. And, and I know that we're pulling out all the stops to really launch this in, a, in an exciting way. Um, and uh, really, I mean, uh, the last thing I'll say about it is uh, the thing that's most exciting for people who are interested in the topic of the Holocaust and interested in research on the Holocaust, there's, what this is doing is it's putting all new material out there for people to access, right? Um, there, are, there are all sorts of documents that, that, that have been in, in private hands uh, for, for so long, um, but that speak directly to this time period and that tell us so much. Uh, and now these are being digitized and, and, and it's really kind of an, an incredible um, uh, opportunity for the public to, to get a 360 degree look at people's lives from that time period. And then, and then you know, going forward as well, the lives that people built after the experience of the Second World War and the Shoah. And, and that's absolutely crucial. So I'm really excited to see it uh, and, and kudos to Beth for years of great work on this project. Um, and so lastly, I'll talk about the project that, um, that I'm working on. Um, I have been uh, for, for many years now interested in the question of how best to teach the Holocaust uh, in higher education. Um, you know, there are, there are well-established um, curricular materials for teaching the Holocaust before you get to university. Um, you know, the kind of gold standard echoes and reflections curriculum that the IHG helps to train teachers to use, um, you know, it is, is well-researched and, and the, the evidence that it works, uh, that students learn about the Holocaust, all of that kind of stuff is out there. But when it comes to the university classroom, it's the Wild West. You can, um, you can, as a professor, I can teach whatever I want, right? Um, I mean, there are certainly some limitations. Um, I should, I can't teach physics, um, for example, um, even if I really wanted to. Uh, but um, when it comes to designing a syllabus for my political science course, I get to decide what goes in the syllabus. I get to decide what we're reading. I get to uh, write the lectures and, and I figure all of that out for myself. Um, and the same is true when it comes to Holocaust education. Uh, so if there is a dedicated Holocaust course at a university, it's taught by someone with some expertise in the Holocaust and they decide what that course is gonna look like. And the only assessment measurements that we have are the tests that students take or the papers that students write and then course evaluations that we do at the end of the semester and that increasingly nobody really pays much attention to. Um, you know, they're, they're online and it's like um, Amazon reviews, right? It's, um, it, it's customer service um, kind of reviews that you get in today's course evaluations. So um, what I'm really interested in and what I've been really interested in is trying to figure out um, what works when it comes to teaching um, at the at the university level when it comes to teaching a topic like the Holocaust. And, and when I when I think about what works, that question is, is really fraught uh, because there are a bunch of different ways for something to work. Um, and uh, I read a study years ago now uh, in a political science journal. It was uh, by a, a group of researchers who were um, trying to evaluate um, how students were learning American government and civil liberties in particular, right, as a topic. They wanted to know if students were, you know, took a, a section of a course that was entirely devoted to civil liberties in the context of American government, you know, did they learn the material and did they care about it at the end of it? And what they determined as a result of this study was that um, the students learned about civil rights and civil liberties but it didn't have any impact at the end of the day on their thinking or their, their feelings about civil rights and civil liberties, right? So they learned the material for the test, but they didn't care any more about it at the end of the day than they did at the beginning of the course. Civil liberties, the idea of it, the idea of other people having these rights, it, it didn't impact them even having learned the material. So I wondered, well, what about a topic like the Holocaust? When students learn the material, um, are they learning it and figuring out the answers and remembering it for the test? Or are they caring? Does it matter to them in some way? Is there any measurable impact having taken a course devoted to the Holocaust? Um, and so uh, one of the things that uh, we set out uh, to try to determine is exactly that. We want to figure out, and, and we're, we're studying a course 
in Lincoln. Um, we're trying to determine whether students care uh, at the end of the course. Uh, in other words, um, is there any change in how they feel about this topic and topics related to it as a result of having taken the course? And um, the hypothesis that we're throwing out there, don't tell the students because they're being uh, assessed on this right now and I don't want them to know the answer. Um, but the hypothesis that we have here is that the materials matter, right? So what you teach, what the, what the instructor chooses to teach the students will have a measurable impact. If you teach the, the topic uh, in a straightforward way like you would teach any topic of, uh, in a history textbook, um, students will learn the answers, right? They'll understand the facts um, and they'll be able to repeat them. And they'll probably say that they learned a lot at the end of the course. And they might say they liked the course because the instructor is popular, whatever, but there won't be any measurable impact on them as a result of having taken the course. However, if you teach personal narratives, if you get the students invested in the stories of individuals, that uh, have a, a measurable impact on whether the students actually internalize some of the things that they're learning about. And whether at the end of the day, beyond simply knowing the facts of the Holocaust, they actually care in a way that we can measure. Now, that's the idea, that's the hypothesis, but it's created all kinds of problems for us um, because um, people don't study this. This is, like, this is just not something that anybody wants to know as far as I can tell, uh, when it comes to education, when I posed this question to my colleagues uh, in the College of Education, they um, looked at me like I was um, from a different planet um, because assessment tends to be about whether you, whether you learned. That's, like, that's what we wanna know. Did you learn this material? Um, and it's, it's not really something that we, we trumpet that we wanna change your behavior as a result of having come to college, right? That's not. <laughs> Not something that people say, um, you know, we're looking to do. But on topics like this, um, I think there is something really important to um, not simply knowing um, the names of concentration camps or the number of people who were murdered um, and, and where the where those things took place, um, but that there should be some kind of um, measurable outcome where people say, "I care about this now. This matters to me." Um, and, uh, and so we set about trying to create measures that we could use to gauge what we're calling engagement with the topic. And we're casting a really wide net um, in terms of the study as we try to measure engagement for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is we don't really know what a great measure of engagement is. Um, and so we're trying to figure that out. But the second is we only have 15 weeks. It's a very short amount of time to try to get somebody to care about something such that it changes their behavior in an observable way. Um, and so we're, um, we're really sort of casting a wide net here and we're including all sorts of things uh, that we would think constitutes kind of engagement with the material uh, that shows that um, it has impacted them in a, in a serious way. And so, you know, we ask things like, are you a student who usually goes to, to your professor's office hours? Um, if you are not, you know, are you going to office hours more uh, for this class? Um, do you usually talk to your family and your friends about the classes that you take? Are you talking about this one, right? Um, and uh, what parts of the course are you talking with people about? Um, we ask if they usually sell their textbooks back at the end of the semester for those who buy them instead of renting them. Uh, and if they do usually sell them back, which is most students, are they keeping any of their books from this semester? And if so, which ones? Um, and you know, it's those sorts of things. Are they, are they going to um, extracurricular lectures or films on topics related to this course, even though they aren't assigned uh, to do so? Um, so these are the kinds of things that we are, um, that we're trying to measure. Uh, and then of course, we're also, um, assessing you know, whether they're learning and, and all the standard kinds of things. When I, when I explain the study to students in the class at the beginning of the semester, all I tell them is that we're interested in how they're learning uh, and that we're gonna do a lot more course evaluation in this class than in a typical class. Uh, so they don't really know what we're up to. Um, we ran this 
as a pilot study on our own several years ago. And the results were very interesting. What we found was um, generally that we were right, uh, that our hypothesis bears out in the data. Um, we created a huge data set uh, that nobody had um, that nobody had put together anything like this before. Um, and we found things like, you know, students were much more uh, likely when we taught the course with these extra materials, they were much more likely to talk to their roommates about specifically those extra materials. Um, when we, um, you know, uh, when, when students um, uh, reported going to office hours, it wasn't because they necessarily had a specific question um, about an upcoming test, but because they wanted to talk more about something that they had read in one of the books that was heavily tilted toward personal narratives. Um, when students were thinking about um, which books to keep, the only book that students consistently reported that they would keep was a book that was, um, that was all personal narratives about the Holocaust. All the other textbooks were sold back. Um, uh, and so, you know, those are the kinds of things that we saw um, over that first period of the study. Um, and uh, we, um, we, recently, uh, we recently received a grant from the, uh, the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany to help us run the study again. Um, they saw the results of our original study. Uh, we published a short paper on it uh, and they were interested in, um, in, in our conclusions. They wanted to know, uh, you know if we were sure that we were right, basically. So we said, well, we'd like to do it again and we'd like to do it better. Uh, and that's what we're doing now. We've, um, because of the grant, we've been able to hire people who specialize in, um, in survey research methodology. Um, so now we have new survey instruments um, and new interview protocols uh, that are based on what we used for the first time, um, but that help us uh, really collect more data and more specific data about the sorts of things that we really want to learn. Um, and our expectation is that our findings will be a lot more robust at the end of this study. It's a four-year study. We're in the first semester of it, um, but we're very fortunate in Lincoln because we have a phenomenal teacher of the Holocaust in, in Gerald Steinacher. Uh, and he um, he teaches a class every spring uh, that's very, very popular and that brings in a wide cross section of students from all over the university, not simply history majors. Um, but, you know, we have people who are majoring in absolutely everything you can imagine under the sun. Um, and um, and so many of them took the course, not because they have a deep and abiding interest in the Holocaust or in human rights or, or social justice topics, but, but because it counts for a university general education requirement. And that's exactly what we want. Um, and, and typically, uh, his course enrolls somewhere between 100 and 150 students each semester. So we get a really, really nice data set. Now, um, this semester, uh, attendance is way down or enrollment is way down as a result of, of the kind of COVID lag in enrollment. And so, you know, we're hoping over the coming years that enrollment will pick back up. But the other thing that we've been able to do as a result of the grant funding is we've added a second class into the study. So we are also studying another course taught by the same instructor, um, which is a kind of contemporary German history course that also, of course, touches on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Um, and so we have in that class a control group, which we didn't have the first time around. Um, and so we have the Holocaust course, which we have altered in, in very serious ways to include all of these personal narratives um, and all sorts of other interventions um, that we're, we're testing every time they do one of those interventions. So like, for example, they'll go on a field trip to the South Street Temple. Um, and learn about um, actually, you know, that Jewish people are still alive and, um, and celebrating their religion and so on in their own city. Um, well, you know, so they're, they're taking trips and then, and then we ask questions at, um, at, at the end of these interventions, um, bringing in guest speakers and, and so on. Uh, all of these things are, are uh, designed um, to specifically uh, add to this course in ways that the other course just doesn't have. The other course is a straightforward history course. It's a good class. People like it, um, but it's, it's textbook based. It's not based on um, these personal narratives. It's not based on, um, you know, trying to encourage a, a sort of personal identification with the, the, the people 
um, who, who participated in or who lived through um, uh, these events that we're talking about. So that's the, um, the, the study that's going on now. Um, obviously, um, yeah, for those of you who were here uh, just a few minutes ago, you can see it dovetails really nicely with the project that Beth Dotan is doing, um, which is uh, you know, uh, really bringing to life some of these personal narratives from Nebraska for students. Um, it's also connected to um, you know, what we're hoping to do for a teacher education workshop with Scott and Kale and the IHE. Um, and we're very, uh, you know, we're very enthusiastic about the, the results because if this works out, what we're doing is demonstrating with data what people in our profession have always believed but can't prove. We know that this is the effective way to teach this topic and topics like it. It's not just the Holocaust. You could do the same thing uh, with uh, the Armenian genocide. You could do the same thing with slavery or the treatment of Native Americans. Or I mean, you you know you 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 pick. Um, we've all. For uh, professors who teach the sorts of topics that I that that I teach and have taught, we all have anecdotes about students who said, you know, I read this book and it changed my life, right? I read this, you know, you taught us about uh, the Rwandan genocide, and I read this book um, and I couldn't sleep afterward, right? As opposed to, I read a history text and I know how many people were killed and I know some of the names of the places where it happened. Um, so we have all those anecdotes, but nobody ever had any data. So you couldn't actually demonstrate it. You couldn't prove that this is what's going on. But if that is what's going on, and if we know that we can have that kind of impact on students, we should be doing it. We should, we should have that impact on students uh, because you can teach them the facts and you can teach them the, the figures and they'll know it. Um, and then in addition to that, you can also present the material in a way that gets them to really care about it to make them feel invested in it um, so that it doesn't go away at the end of the semester. Uh, and the last thing I'll say uh, just on that topic, and then I'll open it up uh, to see what kinds of questions you have, um, is we're also, as a result of, of, of uh, this uh, successfully competing for this grant, we're also gonna be able to, um, to construct a survey that we, that we throw out into the future. Right. So as I said, 15 weeks is not is not very long. And so you don't see a huge shift in behavior from week one of the semester to week 15 of the semester. We, we will see some variation for sure. And, and we're happy to have that. But we're going to be able to ask alumni of this class years into the future. What they remember, what stuck with them, if they have any relationship between what they're doing now to the class that they took to the material that they read about or the, the, the person they met or the, the film that they saw. Um, and I think that we're gonna see some, re I'm hopeful, you know, our idea is we're gonna see some really um, encouraging results as a result of being able to do that. Um, so at the alumni survey is something we're really, really looking forward to where we can ask students, you know, uh, three, four years into the future what they remember about this one course that they took um, and what, We've frozen, hopefully we'll be back up in a second. I will text him to let him know he's frozen. Looks like he'll be trying to sign back on. Sorry for this technology hiccup. And here we and go. And there he is. This is very exciting. Now I'm on my cell phone. <laughs> well, uh, I have no idea what happened. Uh, my Zoom is just is just going like uh, great guns uh, here on my computer, uh, but um, apparently that's not working out for you. So um, 
I have no idea what I was saying when I got cut off because according to my computer, I haven't been cut off. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I was very close to wrapping up what I had prepared to say. So, oh, look, now I'm in two places. This is very, this is great. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this one. Okay. Can you hear me now? Oh, this is terrific. This is gonna be gold for the recording. Just, I mean, really good. Um, okay, so I have no idea what I was saying, uh, but I was very close to the end. Um, and uh, oh, look, I just, I just got a text from Scott telling me that my, my Zoom has frozen. Um, so true. Um, so um, I'm gonna uh, pretend like I made it to the end of my my prepared remarks and uh, thank you all uh, again for listening uh, and then see what kinds of questions you have or what you'd like to talk about. I see. I am. Do you want me to read that? Yeah. All right. Ideally. Oh, you got it. Okay. No, that's good. Um, we can read it for everybody. Uh, it says, Ideally, if you could observe it and measure it, what long range behavioral outcomes are you looking to promote through the course? It seems your current measures might provide some predictive future engagement by looking at current course impact. So uh, it's a great question. Um, what we, um, it's hard to say what we want to um, promote um, beyond simply the, the straightforward um, answer, which is we, we, want, um, we want students to care about the material that they're learning. Um, you know, there's so much instrumentalization of education these days, um, and we hear about it all the time. Um, you know, if you're going to go get a four-year degree um, and you're going to pay all that money, it should, you know, every class you take, um, you know, you, you, it should be built to, um, to, to get you something, right? To like, to buy you something in the future. Um, I, I think that's problematic in and of itself, um, you know, the kind of, uh, what I guess we can call the sort of neoliberal educational model that we're living in, um, in this moment of, of kind of uh, capitalistic overtaking uni the university um, is itself problematic. Um, there is some virtue to taking humanities courses, even if they don't um, lead you to um, a job doing exactly what you just took a class on. Um, but with this in particular, um, it, it seems to me that uh, we want students uh, to say, I learned about this historical event and it matters to me today. Um, and there's, you know, there's a reason that I, that I learned this beyond simply that someone said, this class counts for your general education requirement or accounts for your history major. And beyond that, um, the, the goal would be, I want to learn more about this event or things like it. I, I'm, I'm motivated now to, to continue my education on topics related to human rights, on topics related to um, uh, social justice. I want to, um, I want to figure out what this means for me and what I can do in the future based on what I'm learning. Um, you know, uh, this is a, this was a, a, an absolute uh, catastrophic failure of humanity. What can we do to prevent something like this from ever happening again in the future. What events are happening now that make me reflect on what I've learned um, and that make me wanna do something more, uh, continue my education, talk to other people. Those are the kinds of things that, um, you know, that I think in terms of long range, uh, you know, there's both a short-term and a long-term outcome there. Um, you know, I, I mean, I have lots of anecdotal evidence, so, you know, people always say, well, what do your students go on to do when they graduate with a political science degree? I have lots of evidence of students who have taken these courses from me, from my colleagues who have gone on and, you know, they've, they've been involved with Teach for America or the Peace Corps. They've, uh, they've, you know, started working for um, NGOs either in the U.S. or overseas. Um, you know, they've, they've become full-time um, you know, human rights activists as a result of their college education. Uh, they went to law school because they wanted to practice 
um, you know, um, uh, civil rights law or uh, they wanted to um, uh, work on, I mean, I have students now who are, who are practicing internationally uh, in human rights law, uh, environmental justice uh, initiatives and so on. Um, it would be great to see, to talk to those people and say, you know, um, what led you in that direction, right? What made you want to do that? Um, and if they say, oh, I just, I don't know, right? I, I doubt the answer is I don't know. Um, uh, you know, I think that um, I can pinpoint for myself exactly why I am in the job that I'm in today. I know the day that I decided to do it, and I know the professor's name from the class that I was taking. And I think that that's the kind of thing that would be, um, it would be so interesting to be able to document on a, on a big scale, right? Like with big data, mm. rather than just a kind of one-off. Scott? So my question is a bit loaded. Um, why do you think on a, in a university model that, the, that Holocaust education, the Holocaust class is um, in a sense safe or is popular as opposed to, you know, for example, you and I both testified about possible legislation here in Nebraska and in many states, it says teach the Holocaust and other acts of genocide, but yet um, we don't necessarily see the teaching of other genocides. So why do you think that Holocaust education is, excuse the word thing, it's like, is, is more popular? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, or if I, if I do have an answer, it's purely speculative. And I, so I don't want to play in that sandbox um, and, and get myself in trouble. Um, what I will say is you're 100% right um, that these courses don't have, there's no flack um, associated with, with teaching these courses. Um, there's nobody out there suggesting that they shouldn't be taught or that, you know, there's nobody protesting them. Um, I have, you know, uh, another colleague in history, Bedros Dermatosian, who is terrific. Uh, he teaches courses on comparative genocide uh, for the Harris Center and for the history department. Um, and um, I mean, he's a scholar of the Armenian genocide, um, which is a completely, which is, which is, uh, you know, the sort of thing that you're talking about, Scott, right? Um, that, you know, I mean, when, uh, when this bill um, that we talked about at the very beginning, LB 888 here in Nebraska was introduced the first time around um, by Senator Sarah Howard uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a huge Turkish population that turned up to protest it, right? Because, um, because the Armenian genocide was mentioned. Um, and so, you know, the, the safety of, of teaching the Holocaust um, I, I said I wasn't going to speculate, but I'll speculate. Why not? Right? It's only being recorded. Um, the, America as the good guy is part of that story, um, and I think that uh, that's part of what makes it safe to be taught here in America. Um, right? There's a straightforward part of the story as it's taught that um, you know that the, the Holocaust was a terrible thing um, happening uh, in Europe. Uh, and then the U.S. came and defeated the Nazis um, and saved the Jewish people uh, who were still alive. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure we all know what that narrative um, le leaves out. Um, but it's uh, but, you know, uh, America as the good guy in World War II um, is is certainly uh, certainly not wrong. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have a lot of students in Lincoln, for example, who report that they take the Holocaust course because they're very interested in World War II history, military history. Um, and um, there's no question that what is that a, a big part of what's driving them is exactly that, right? The, um, the America as the good guy in the Second World War um, mentality. Agnes, did you want to say something? You're on mute. Agnes, you're on mute. Agnes, can you hear me? You're on mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> I don't think. 
Okay. Oh, all right, there you are. Okay, I'm a Holocaust survivor. And Americans did not want to hear about the Holocaust for 50 years after it happened. And all of a sudden it became very popular. As a matter of fact, I'm joining with your program late because I was speaking to a class in uh, Montana about the Holocaust. The Holocaust is the worst, the, the, the biggest destroying of human lives in history. And it cannot be compared to any of the other genocides. And I mentioned to my kids often when I talk about the other genocides, especially the ones recently like in Darfur. But you cannot compare them with the 6 million Jews they killed and the, the, the homosexuals and the gypsies. And I mean, the only thing I can compare it this with is today's war in the Ukraine and it scares me to death. So I am absolutely reliving the Second World War. I was a hidden child. I was never in a camp, but I lost my whole family. And that's, that's why I think the Holocaust is, has become so popular. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, part of my motivation for doing this study in the first place is that um, it is very well known that hearing direct testimony from survivors is the single most effective way to get people Absolutely. to emotionally connect Absolutely. to this topic. And the fact that you have been and that you continue to share your story is the most meaningful um, uh, thing for, for all of us. Um, uh, it, 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 there's nothing like it in the world. Um, and uh, all that we are trying to do is to, to find um, uh, even a shred of, uh, of what you uh, and, and so many others uh, have been able to do over the years. Uh, so um, thank you. It has affected the rest of my life. Uh, many years later, I started in therapy and that has helped me a great deal. And I always tell students, if you have a problem with something, don't be ashamed to reach out because there's always a solution. This is where I will unapologetically uh, promote our week of understanding next week where Agnes will be speaking at both Duchenne to the entire student population and to Ralston High School to um, I think their entire student population. And we also have two community events on Tuesday night. Uh, our, our friend Peter will be speaking at the Durham virtually. You can go to the Durham's website and sign up for it. And as a part of the Beit Midrash on Wednesday evening, also virtually is the uh, playing, the recording that was made of the play that we premiered in November that Mark just put up the, the logo for when we go away. And uh, we encourage all of you, if you have any trouble signing up, just get in touch with me. But uh, our week of understanding is next week. And, and um, again, exactly what Agnes said, being able to hear the, uh, and Ari, that as far as hearing testimony from a number of our uh, survivors in our community, but also outside the community. And hopefully next year we'll be in person live. Well, and this power of the, the, the personal story, I feel is kind of, um, late to Western education, better late than never, I'm sure. But just out of curiosity, um, Ari, what is the, um, like the humanities general ed requirement for UNL? How many hours? Do you know? Uh, you've, you've, um, you've exposed my weakness, Kale. Oh, um, <laughs> sorry. I have, uh, no, 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 it's, still, it's totally fine. Um, I have literally no idea how a student actually gets a degree from the university where I have taught for 15 years. Um, and there is a, a complex series of events that occur um, where they are presented with an online portal that requires them to fill out all sorts of boxes. And I am uh, so thankful 
that I have nothing to do with, um, with advising students about how to navigate this system um, because it is, a, it is a gigantic mess. Um, what I will say is that um, there are, as far as I know, there are general education requirements um, and you get to choose from within certain boxes. So let's say there's seven different boxes um, that range from the physical sciences, biological sciences, social sciences, humanities, right? These are the general education boxes. You could take uh, the history of the Holocaust as, as, a, as something that does check one of those boxes, but you could also not choose it, right? You could choose to take intro to American government, um, and those would both count as the same thing. Um, and so there is, certainly is some um, self-selection going on, uh, which we're trying, to, we have to recognize in our, um, uh, you know, in our study, because students are choosing to study the Holocaust as opposed to some other course that they could have taken. And we ask them why, certainly. Um, and some of them choose to do it because they heard good things about the professor. And some of them choose to do it because it's taught on a Tuesday and a Thursday before lunch. Um, you know, it's it, it, in some ways, it's, it's quite random, uh, the way that students um, select their courses. Um, so uh, to speak to Mark's comment, for example, in the chat, I don't teach a single course that is required at the university. Um, many of my colleagues do. All of my courses are, um, anyone who takes a class of mine in political science uh, is doing so um, as, a, as an elective in some sense. They count to their major, right? It, it, it's counting, it checks off a box or two boxes, or if they do it really well, it might check off three boxes depending on what they're majoring in and minoring in, but they could take something else to fulfill the requirement. They don't ever have to see me if they don't want to. Um, and, uh, and each department does these things differently. It just, for me, I'm fortunate in that the courses I teach are all at the upper level where there's lots of choice for undergraduate students. Yeah, and the, and the reason I asked is I'm a graduate of UNK and I know when I went there, it had a very robust general ed program. So you had to take all the classes that were associated with your major, but you also had to do 12 hours of, of general ed and you had to do certain number of hours of humanity courses. And now they have shrunk that to three hours, which is one class in the humanities, if you are not a humanities major. And, and this is what I find the most concerning, right? Is we don't call it humanities for no reason. And we talk all the time in K-12 education about we, we want what, what my dad would call, you know, the education of the soul, right? We want people to learn empathy. We want people to learn to be better humans from humanities classes. And, and, and that, is, uh, that is shrinking, right? That, that requirement to take humanities classes. Um, so I find this really, really encouraging. And, and also, you know, we talk about that a lot too, when we're, when we're reporting on grants and we have to give empirical data, quantitative data, and that's all we have. How many people did we reach in this program? How many people heard this, but we have no ability to track them afterwards to find the qualitative data. Did it change them? You know, did those, did the seeds take and did they germinate? And what are they doing with that? So I find this really exciting. Thank you. Yeah. And we're trying to get those qualitative um, points as quantitative data, right? Which everybody, which everybody wants. Uh, and, and Kale, just to speak for a moment to what you said before, you know, I hit on this idea, the kind of hypothesis, um, actually not from, uh, from history or from political science, um, but I was reading um, a philosophy uh, text. Um, one of my favorite philosophers is um, a guy called Richard Rorty. Um, and uh, he was a philosopher, but he ended up spending most of his career teaching broadly in, a, in what was called a humanities program at the University of Virginia. And, um, and his idea was that um, uh, the way that people taught philosophy was broken. Um, and that instead, um, you know, if you really wanted to change how people thought about the world around them, uh, you should teach them literature um, and uh, or some combination of literature with philosophy. Um, uh, and, and the reason was, of course, that um, putting yourself in the perspective of another person, which is what literature encourages you to do, um, really is how you make is how you make change. 
uh, you get to you get to live in somebody else's shoes um, or see the world through somebody else's eyes. Um, and uh, and so I kind of took that idea and and basically we're teaching a history course with a heavy dose of literature. Um, and I think that there is something there's really something to this. And I think that you know, when, when we see the results, I'm really hopeful that the things that stand out to these students in the history course um, is, that they, is that they read a bunch of stories that were written um, from a kind of first person perspective. And it encouraged them to, to get into that person's life and to, and to think to themselves, what would it be like if it was me, uh, right? How would, I, how would I live in a situation like this? What would my reactions be? And, and, and that's really how you get people to um, I mean, that's, that's the core of empathy. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's, that's what we're I had the to. I had the very good fortune of being taught philosophy that way at UNK, you know, with Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn and yeah, and literature. Oh, Beth has a comment. <laughs> There's the UNL um, ACE requirements. 10 requirements that help develop intellectual and practical skills, including proficiency in written, oral, and visual communications, inquiry techniques, critical and creative thinking, quantitative applications, information assessment, teamwork, and problem solving. Right. And so those are the 10 boxes. I don't know if I thought there were seven. Now there are 10 boxes and you have to, and, and courses can count for different ACE requirements. And I don't remember what this course counts, which ACE requirement it is, um, but certainly it is one of those. Um, and, uh, and that is part of why students sign up for the history of the Holocaust, because it, it checks an ACE box for them. Well, before I, you know, say more words, because we all know Kale can say a lot of words. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Ari? You know, I always tell the kids that listening to one survivor is worth a thousand pages in a textbook, mm -hmm. because you get more feelings from a survivor than you could ever get from reading something. And I think I always intuitively knew that, Agnes, but now that we have studies, you know, from Echoes and Reflections and the Claims Conferences have actually proven that, that first person testimony is the most effective way. And unfortunately, Kale, my generation is dying out. Uh, I am one of the younger survivors. I was only 11 when the war came. So, and... We're coming to the end of the line of survivors speaking out meant that many second generation people uh, have come forward with their parents' stories. And I don't think that's as good, but that's the next best thing. And it has, you know, it has, it has an effect, but you're right. Absolutely. It is not the same Absolutely. as you. And so, which is another opportunity to just thank you for continuing to do this. You know, my son, my oldest son said the other day, and we were talking about the current war. And I said, how come you're not as upset about it as I am? And he said, mom, you lived it and I didn't. And oh, I think that's the truest thing he could have ever said. And that's true. And I'm grateful he didn't live it. Yeah. But I think that's a very good point. And this, you know, the study mm -hmm. that you're doing with the personal narratives, you know, opens up a whole conversation about lived experience versus what I think American education has been so long uh, structured around objective truths. Yes. And how we don't, I have found my generation doesn't do a very good job with nuance and holding paradox because we were told, no, this is true instead of saying, this is true, all of this is true, all of these stories are true, yeah. how, do you, how do you reconcile that and hold that? So um, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, and to, to, um, to kind of underscore that, there's this question too of, you know, um, and what do they mean to you, right? Um, I think that, you know, something that Agnes is pointing out and something that, um, again, my colleague Gerald has always pointed out, um, for, for many years, B. Carp used to come and speak to his class. And this was for, I mean, for the whole semester, this was the thing that every student talked about, 
right? And it was the thing that every student remembered. And when they talked to other people about the course, th this was the defining uh, day of the course, right? And so when you, you know, when you talk to students about, well, what, what do these things mean to you? The idea, the, the idea that there was someone that they could sit in the same room with, right? And, um, and, and, and speak to directly and ask questions and so on. That's why this is the, the you know, there was no, it wasn't difficult to derive meaning for them from that experience. And what we're trying to figure out is um, what else can we use, right? What, what else can, uh, I mean, nothing can replicate it, right? Watching the same exact testimony on video can't replicate it. No. Right. So what can we do that gets us even even part of the way to building that kind of meaning for students um, so that the next generation, the next generation and so on can have some of that experience, can have some of that meaning uh, built for them so that it doesn't just become a thing that they, you know, like like they took a course on the fall of the Roman Empire. Right. It, it, we want to preserve this class, this topic, and and topics like it, right? In some way, like it. We want to preserve them as somehow special, different um, for students. Uh, that that it, it causes them to to think differently afterward, um, to 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 change their behavior to want to learn more, to want to do something. Uh, that's the kind of, you know, that's, that's, that's what's in, in some sense, that's what's driving this project. Beth? Hi, Beth. Just a quick comment. Um, I read a really interesting article written by Jean Starrett. She is in the Broward County in Florida area. And they also did a really um, interesting study on how Holocaust education um, affects uh, critical citizenship. So in a sense, it's that same outcome and, and clearly that this has not, had not been done um, significantly. I don't know if you've worked with her, um, but they are doing continued studies with this and um, what they found in their study that they um, looked at cross country is that the most effective Thing that the students remembered, of course, was was narrative and and personal stories. So, so there again, Agnes, your point is well taken. And Jean um, is amazing and um, actually looks at quantitative um, effects of this. So maybe a good a good person to reach out to. Absolutely, yeah, that'd be great. So, even though I speak on Zoom. I don't think it's as effective when I'm with a live audience. It's better than nothing, but I can't feel the audience's reaction on Zoom. And that encourages me. I know what they wanna hear and when I can feel their uh, reaction. So I don't know, Zoom is better than nothing, but I, I can't wait to get before live audiences. I agree. I mean, Zoom has allowed us to get you to Montana and Florida and um, Canada without leaving the, the comfort of your own home. So there's a um, small yeah. silver lining there, but you're right. There is that connection and, and Scott and Beth and Ari and I have all seen it in a um, recital hall full of, of like eighth graders, for example, who all then want their picture taken with you mm -hmm. afterwards, right? Because there is that personal story and that personal connection. And for the rest of their lives, they will say, I met Agnes Schwartz. Oh, survivor. They may not remember the name, but they remember they met a Holocaust survivor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I yeah. mean, I think that's the whole point, right? Is that Absolutely. it's the human my connection. Name in, my name is not important. The fact that I live there and I'm talking about it and I'm still here to talk about it, so hopefully for a few more years, that's important. Any other questions for Ari before we let him go about his day? 
Ari, I wish I could have heard more of your story, but as I said, I was talking to a group of kids in Montana, so. Agnes, I'll make sure I send you the link. Uh, we've recorded this so you can hear the whole thing. So Oh, it'll... that would be great. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Kale, we tell us about we, Hopefully Sorry. we can get together. Hopefully we'll get together, Agnes, and we can talk. I'd love to. Next year in Omaha. Ask, ask, <laughs> ask Kale or Scott to give you my email address. Done. I'll do it. For sure. All right. Absolutely. Kale, will you tell us about next month, please? Yes. Yeah, so next month, um, oh, shoot, I had the date in my head. What is it? The 21st? The, the third Thursday, Kale. The third Thursday. I know. I'm, re I'm looking down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, 21st. 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 Sorry about that. April 21st, we're going to have Doyle Stebbick and Morgan Bailey from the Anne Frank Center at the University of South Carolina with us. And, and they are the people that we work with um, with our new Anne Frank traveling exhibit that's going throughout Nebraska. So they will be here to tell us how they got into this, um, what else they are doing in their programs there and to engage in conversation with us. And uh, if you, I hope you will be there again, we'll hopefully be able to record it too. If you can't, we'll, we'll post that on the Jewish Federation of Omaha's YouTube page. I wanna thank Ari for everything he does for us and with us and for being here today. This is a great discussion. And I uh, hope the rest of you have a wonderful day. Again, week of understanding next week with our two community events, Tuesday night and Wednesday night. And if you need any of the links or anything like that, if you trouble signing up, please let us know. And thank you for being here. Yep. Thank, thank you, you all. Much. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for the conversation. This was great. So nice to see you all. This was thank great. Thanks, all. Ari. And thank you to our newcomers. We hope we see you back next month. Bye-bye. Bye. Agnes. Yes. Um, are we good for Monday morning? Yes. Oh, good. Is that, this is, this is you, my... Do you still have some of my books? I do. Okay. I will. And this school Monday morning is my best friend's school. So I will get those to her and okay. let you know. Okay. What are we selling them for? 20? Uh, you can sell them for 20.